going to talk is the shoulder now this is a big topic and inside this topic i'll start with some of the relevant anatomy of the shoulder it's an important uh, you know point always whenever we start the a fresh topic or fresh you know site in orthopedics we have to know about relevant anatomy not in detail okay only the relevant point after that we'll enter into the shoulder joint and we'll talk extensively about shoulder joint dislocation very important question from the exam point of view as well as from the clinical practice then i'll talk about clavicle fracture another very common type of injury and one of the common medical problem which is known as frozen shoulder okay frozen shoulder so many people are suffering from this so these are the contents of this topic so this is a big topic let me start this now see here all of you please focus on this screen focus on this x ray what can you see on this x ray yes anybody what can you see on this x ray what's the finding you can you can notice here see this this is the head of the humerus the head of the humerus and this is called glenoid cavity now the head of the humerus has come out of the glenoid cavity now what is the diagnosis yes shoulder dislocation dislocation exactly dislocation of the shoulder joint or shoulder joint dislocation or simply you can call it shoulder dislocation this is uh, look look like the anterior type of shoulder dislocation okay so with this let's enter into the topic proper the shoulder joint is a ball and socket type of synovial joint this is an example of synovial joint and among uh, among the classification of synovial joint it is a ball and socket type of joint now this ball part is formed by the head of the humerus and socket part is formed by glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa of the scapula that's why it is also known as gleno humeral joint gleno humeral joint so let me write that term for you it's a very commonly used clinical term gleno humeral joint so this is another term for shoulder joint the shoulder ball or humeral head fits loosely in the socket called glenoid cavity and this socket is quite shallow it is not a deep socket or a deep cavity that's why shoulder joint is the most movable or mobile joint in our body but at the same time because of very loose fitting or because of shallow glenoid it is the most commonly dislocated joint as well so we we uh, often say you know shoulder joint enjoys mobility in the expense of stability it is very freely mobile joint but it is not very stable type of joint in the other hand hip joint okay just comparing hip joint with shoulder joint remember uh, the two components in hip joint what are the two components let me ask that question now what are the two parts of the hip joint which bones form the hip joint yes who can answer pelvic bones and femur humor and hip bone exactly pelvic bone and the femur or hip bone and the femur but you know uh, that uh, is a little bit vague answer uh, we want to be a little bit more specific than that the part from the hip bone is called acetabulum and the part from the femur is head of the femur so head of the femur will be fitting into the acetabulum now remember that acetabulum is a deep socket or is a deep type of cavity whereas glenoid fossa is very shallow so what what i am saying here i'm just comparing shoulder joint with the hip joint hip joint is very stable joint and this joint doesn't okay dislocate commonly 
whereas shoulder joint is one of the most commonly dislocated joint. Let's move on. Okay, now see this, a little bit of relevant anatomy of the shoulder area. There are four joints present in the shoulder area. And these joints are glenohumeral joint, which is called shoulder joint. AC. Now, what is this AC in the shoulder? A stands Acro for acromio. Very good. Acromio clavicular yeah. joint. Excellent. Acromio clavicular joint. Not very important from the exam point of view. Okay. Acromio clavicular joint. Another is sternoclavicular joint, when clavicle attaches with sternum. And the last one is scapulothoracic joint. This is not a real joint, actually. This is not a real joint. The anterior border or anterior surface of the scapula is attaching itself with the thoracic wall. And we call it scapulothoracic joint. It is not a true or real joint. Now, I want all of you to focus on this important anatomy. So let us take the name very quickly here. Look at here. This, this bone is the manubrium sterni. Okay, this is the upper part of the sternum bone. Now here is clavicle. This is a clavicle bone. This is the okay, uh, sternal end. Okay, and this is acromial end. See this? This is the AC joint we are talking about. Acromioclavicular joint. Because it the two processes, okay, uh, the end of the clavicle attaches with acromial process of the scapula. So this is the clavicle bone. Everybody know now? This wide bone, okay, a flat type of bone is called scapula. Scapula, it has got many different parts. So this is a big bone. See this? scapula okay this is humerus this is the head of the humerus you can clearly see this is called the anatomical neck of the humerus this is the shaft of the humerus now this process this number four you can clearly see is called coracoid process of the scapula and this is a free structure okay it is not attached with any other bone the free end of this coracoid process is not attached with other bone. So these are the different, uh, you know, uh, anatomical parts of shoulder area. Regarding the range of motion, ROM means range of motion of the shoulder, it, it uh, enjoy high degree of, you know, freedom, we should say, or motion, or high degree of movement. And the different types of movement are called abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, internal rotation, external rotation, and the combination of all of them is called circumduction. Circumduction is a rotatory type of movement which is involving all of them together. So abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, internal rotation, external rotation, and circumduction. These are the types of movement which are possible in shoulder joint. Now, what is this range of movement? Okay, we'll talk about them, them later. It will be repeated later again. Now, why shoulder joint is one of the most unstable joint? This is a common question which is asked to the student. And some of the important answers are provided here. Number one, the glenoid cavity is very shallow. And the head of the humerus is a big one in comparison to that glenoid cavity. So it is not properly fitting there. The first important point. Second one, the capsule which is surrounding the shoulder joint is loose. It is not very strong or not tightly fitting there. And third one, the ligaments which are surrounding the shoulder joint are lax. Okay. This capsule is actually formed by these different ligaments which are surrounding the shoulder joint. We'll talk about them a bit later. Regarding the different types of dislocation in the shoulder, there are three types of dislocation. Okay, this class is all about that, okay? They are anterior dislocation, they are posterior dislocation, and inferior dislocation. But among them, 
anterior dislocation is the most common one. Now, this is the bony anatomy of the shoulder joint. Another better type of a picture is shown here. So let me highlight again. This area we are talking now from the human body, the shoulder area. Okay, now see this, this is the shoulder area. So here is the head of the humerus. Okay, this is glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa, which acts like a socket and head of the humerus acts like a ball. That's why it is a ball and socket type of joint, also known as glenohumeral joint. Here is a clavicle. So which, which, which is this, this process which I am uh, showing you right now? What is this? Acromion. 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 Exactly. This is acromion process. Okay, because it is attached with the lateral end of the clavicle. And this is called coracoid process. See here, this is free. It is not attached with any bone. So coracoid process. Now another okay, anatomical picture. So uh, same similar type of things are shown. Let's not hurry. See here, this is scapula bone. Scapula. This is humerus. Here is the clavicle. So these are the three main bone which forms the shoulder area. Some other, uh, you know, structures are also shown. Rotator cuff muscle or the tendon. Now let's talk about them. Before I go to the rotator cuff muscle, this is the X-ray of the adult shoulder. This is anteroposterior view. So this is also very important for the orthopedic students. So in the X-ray, how the shoulder joint looks. Now see here. So this is head of the humerus. Okay, this is a humerus bone. Here is the uh, anatomical neck of the humerus. Okay. This is anatomical neck right here. And this is called surgical neck. Okay, this is anatomical neck. Here is the surgical neck. The humerus fracture very commonly occurs from the surgical neck site. And we'll talk about that later. This is greater tubercle of the humerus. Here is lesser tubercle of the humerus. These are a bit of a prominent part towards the upper end of the humerus. Now, on the other hand, this is a glenoid fossa. It is seen like this in the X-ray, glenoid fossa. Is this joint dislocated or not? Yes. Do you think this joint is dislocated or it's a normal one? It's um, a normal one. Exactly. This is absolutely normal. Okay. See that? The head of the humerus is nicely touching the glenoid fossa. So it is not separated from there. So this is the normal one. Now, what is the other, other you know, structures here? There is a clavicle. You can clearly see this is clavicle. This is the lateral end of the clavicle. Here is the medial end of the clavicle. Now, there is a gap between lateral end of the clavicle and acromion process. Why is this gap present here? Why? Cartilage. Because there's a soft structure which is not seen in the X-ray. Very good. Excellent. The cartilages and the uh, you know, soft tissue they are not seen in the X-ray. So please don't mistaken this as a fracture or dislocation, okay? This is not the point. That's why the normal X-ray has to be identified first. Then only you can identify the abnormal one. That is the purpose of showing this, this X-ray right now. And you know, this type of explanation. So where is the coracoid process? We need to identify it. It is right here. The coracoid process of the scapula Okay. And these are the different ribs. See this first rib. The uppermost rib is the first rib. And from uh, like that, we can count always. The rib counting is very easy from the posterior side. First rib, second rib, like that, you can count and slowly go downwards. This is the inferior angle of the scapula. There is the medial border of the scapula. And similarly, this is sterno 
clavicular joint. Again, I cannot sheet properly because of the cartilage and the soft tissue. Now, before we go for the break, let's, let's talk about two important points here. Stabilizers of the shoulder. There are two types of stabilizers, static and dynamic. Statics are ligament, dynamics are muscle. We are talking about stabilizers of the shoulder joint. Now, before we talk about the stabilizers, though there are important stabilizers of shoulder joint, but still it is one of the most unstable joint okay, among the major joint. We always compare hip joint with shoulder joint and hip joint is the very stable type, whereas shoulder joint is unstable type of joint. Means it can be dislocated or subluxated very easily. Now, let's learn what are those stabilizers? There are of two types, soft tissue stabilizers, okay? And uh, I mean, soft tissue stabilizers are of two types, static and dynamic. The static stabilizers are the ligaments of the shoulder. The important ligaments of the shoulder's joint are capsule. The capsule is also considered a type of, you know, a modified type of ligament. Capsule surrounds the joint from everywhere. Okay, this capsule is reinforced by some of the true ligament like superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligament. Superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligament. So these are already there. They uh, strengthen the capsule from every side, and then. Inside the uh, glenoid fossa, there is a fibrocartilaginous rim, which is called labrum. This labrum is present on the margin of the glenoid fossa. And this labrum will make that glenoid fossa a little bit deeper. Okay, a little bit deeper because it is a fibrocartilaginous rim. Whereas the dynamic stabilizers are the rotator cuff muscle. And these muscles, they surround the shoulder joint. Now, let's uh, talk about them. You see here, all of you, please focus here. Now, I want you to focus on this picture, okay? Now look here. This is called the capsule of the shoulder joint. So let me use the highlighter. This is the capsule of the shoulder joint. Here is the glenoid cavity. Now look at the rim of the glenoid fossa or cavity. This is called labrum. This labrum is formed by fibrocartilaginous component. Now, there are so many muscles you can see which are surrounding, okay? Uh, these muscles, these are called rotator cuff muscle. Look at this picture now. There is a joint capsule. It looks like this when you look from the outside, joint capsule, okay? And there are different ligaments which run uh, from the uh, scapula to the humeral side. These are called glenohumeral ligament and they strengthen this capsule. These are the static stabilizer. Whereas the dynamic stabilizers are the rotator cuff muscle and they are four. The four rotator cuff muscles are supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Okay, uh, in the short form, we call them SITS. S I T S, SITS. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Now, let's know a little bit more about them. Now, see here. Now, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis are the rotator cuff muscle. Very important question from the exam point of view and the viva. These are the attachment of this muscle. Proximally, all of them are attached to the scapula, and distally, they are attached to the humerus. That's how they stabilize the shoulder joint. 
supraspinatus is attached distally to the greater tuberosity or tubercle of the humerus. Infraspinatus also at the same site. Teres minor also at the same site, but subscapularis is inserted on the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Now, the important point here is nerve supply. So every student should know about the nerve supply of these muscles. Now see this. Supraspinatus and infraspinatus is supplied by suprascapular nerve. Whereas teres minor is supplied by axillary nerve. Now there is another muscle which is also supplied by axillary nerve. What is that? Deltoid. Excellent. Deltoid. Very good. Deltoid. Deltoid is the major muscle of that of that area. Okay. And another minor muscle which is supplied by axillary nerve is teres minor. Don't forget that. Very important MCQ question. And the last one, subscapularis. It is by subscapular nerve. All of these nerves are coming from the brachial plexus. Now, what are the functions of these muscles? Supraspinatus is responsible for abduction movement of the shoulder joint. Abduction means moving away from the midline. It's called abduction. Infraspinatus, external rotation. Teres minor is also for external rotation, whereas subscapularis is a very strong muscle is responsible for internal rotation and adduction. Adduction means the limb is coming towards the midline again. That is adduction. So we'll talk about all of these in the subsequent slide. Okay, let's move on. Okay, now, once again, this is such an important point, okay? Right here, when we are talking, please, if you listen properly, if you pay attention, you will remember the name of these muscles. Sits, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. It is not teres major, okay? It's teres minor. Please remember that. Other, other things are quite easy. Now, this is how these rotator cuff muscles look like. See this supraspinatus is right here. This is infraspinatus. This is teres minor, and this is subscapularis. So it is, uh, you know, covering the glenoid cavity from all side, along with glenoid labrum, along with different ligament like capsule of the shoulder joint. These also help in the stabilization of the shoulder. Now, this picture or slide is telling us about the function of this muscle once again, okay? In a very good way, supraspinatus is responsible for abduction, infraspinatus, external rotation, teres minor, external rotation, and subscapularis is for internal rotation and adduction. So these are the uh, different functions of rotator cuff muscle. This is the different direction where uh, the uh, you know, humerus is moving. Remember, when we talk about the movement of the joint, we always uh, you know, uh, uh, talk this movement in relation to the distal bone, which is a part of the joint. In this case of shoulder joint, the proximal part is formed by glenoid fossa or the scapula, and the distal component is humerus. So according to the movement of the humerus, we name this different type of movement. External rotation, internal rotation, okay, adduction or abduction. In all these movement, the humerus is moving accordingly. Now, what about the movement of the shoulder? What is the range of motion in the shoulder joint? See this, flexion is almost 180 degree in the shoulder joint. Extension is about 45 to 60. Now it is difficult for me okay, to show uh, what is flexion and extension. Uh, I want all my students, okay, please uh, go through some good books in anatomy, and even in orthopedics. Anatomy books would be enough. Okay, Those books 
are clearly describing what is the flexion movement of the shoulder joint and what is the extension movement. Now, flexion movement is towards the anterior side of the body. If we uh, you know, move our shoulder towards the anterior side of the body, this is the flexion movement. Extension is towards the back side, extension. Now, abduction is towards the lateral side, you know, when I'm raising the upper arm, okay, upwards, that is abduction movement. And adduction is opposite to that. When I'm bringing that arm uh, towards the midline, adduction. Medial rotation and lateral rotation are very easy to understand. And circumduction is a combination of all of them. Now, if we analyze, we don't, we don't ask, you know, what is the range of movement of each of these uh, movement? But one important point you need to you know, take a note from here is, this shoulder joint is highly movable joint. It enjoys high degree of freedom. And the combination movement of all of these is called circumduction. Now, Another anatomical part before we go move on to the topic proper. All of you, please have a look there. Which muscles are responsible for each of these, you know, movement? Sometimes some MCQ question may be uh, related to this. So let's talk quickly about them. The flexion movement. See this. The flexion movement of the shoulder joint. Okay, the important muscle is pectoralis major. This is a major muscle which is present on our chest. Pectoralis major. So this is responsible for flexion of the shoulder joint. Deltoid is also responsible, but deltoid is mainly, okay, deltoid is mainly responsible for abduction rather than flexion. There are different you know, fibers of the deltoid actually. So those different fibers are responsible for this multiple movement. But if your examiner asks, always answer abduction is the major function of deltoid muscle. Without deltoid, we cannot abduct the shoulder joint properly. Coracobrachialis, long head of the biceps brachii are the other muscles which are responsible for flexion of the shoulder joint. But pectoralis major is the most important one. Regarding the extension, it's latissimus dorsi now, which is the muscle on the back side. Okay, and so many others are also responsible. See there, teres major, pectoralis major also, deltoid, and even the long head of triceps tracheae, brachiae, triceps brachiae. Okay, is also responsible. You can simply say triceps here and biceps, okay? You don't need to add brachii either. It's very well understood. So extension, latissimus dorsi, and teres major. What about the adduction? Coracobrachialis, pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, and teres major. They are for the adduction. And regarding the abduction, it's deltoid, the most important muscle, followed by supraspinatus. Internal rotation is done by subscapularis. This is the important muscle here. And external rotation is by teres minor and infraspinatus. Now, I'm sure many of the students know already where are uh, this muscle belongs to, okay? Which compartment of the arm or where exactly these muscles belong? This may be another question which is asked by your examiner. And try to know about the nerve supply as well. So let me repeat again, nerve supply of the muscle and where these muscles belong. These are the two things which every student should know. So let's move on. Now, let's focus on this X-ray. And see here. This is head of the humerus. Very good x-ray actually, head of the humerus. This is glenoid fossa or cavity. Okay, glenoid fossa or cavity. This bone is clavicle, clavicle. 
this is a chromium process because uh, there is a joint between a chromium process and the lateral end of the clavicle and this is the coracoid process of the scapula and this is the scapula bone so this is the chest wall so this is called shoulder joint Now another X-ray, okay. Now can you, all of you, please focus on this. Can you compare between these two X-ray, please? What abnormality you can see there? All of you, please see. This location, right side. This Exactly. There is a dislocation. Very good. Dislocation in the second X-ray absolutely correct now how do you know there is a dislocation okay so because you are a beginner you are a, you have just started to see this type of x-ray so you need to develop that eye that vision which immediately picks the abnormal finding now see this this bone is in nicely in contact with this this glenoid cavity it is in contact it is not moving anywhere it's not going upward or downwards okay if we draw a straight line here, it will go to the upper part of the glenoid cavity and from the lower part, it will go to the lower, isn't it? It doesn't look like displaced at all. But look here, okay, look at this. This is glenoid cavity here. This is the circumference of the glenoid cavity and head of the humerus is completely out of the glenoid cavity. So this is dislocation. It is coming anterior. So we call it anterior dislocation. So very, very easy type of diagnosis. Okay, so see that these anatomical landmarks are so important. So this is again shown here. And in the orthopedics viva exam, everywhere, okay, wherever you go, this type of questions are very commonly asked to you. We just take this type of x-ray and uh, you know point it out and we want students to tell the name of these important landmarks see this so this number five what is this number five humerus humerus oh. which which part of the humerus what we call that shaft of the humerus. Shaft of the humerus. it is shaft of the humerus very good shaft of the humerus okay so number four is what is number four Head, head of the of humerus. Head of the humerus. Very good. Head of the humerus. Now let me show you uh, and ask you the question here. Now, all of you, please see here this area, this line which you can see, this white line. What is this called? This white line. Surgical. Surgical. Surgical, surgical neck of the. Is it surgical? Is it surgical neck or anatomical neck? Please. Anatomical. Anatomical. Neck. Yes, this is anatomical neck. Okay, this is anatomical neck. Surgical neck is a very narrow area, a little bit inferior, somewhere here. This is surgical neck. Now, how, why? Why are you confused? Don't get confused here. This head is a rounded structure. This is the upper end of the humerus, actually, the upper end of the humerus not all area is considered the head the head is very rounded okay and very smooth area in that upper part of the humerus okay once that area is over when you come slightly inferior to that that is called neck of the humerus and uh, still if you come inferior the surgical neck would be there now this is acromion process this number two is the clavicle and number one is the coracoid process okay please repeat this until and unless you are quite confident this is the lateral view of the shoulder now there are different types of view of shoulder okay different types of view this view is called glenohumeral view glenohumeral view of the adult shoulder now there is one thing which is uh, you know incorrectly identified uh, in this uh, x-ray and it is already shown here actually 
the lesser tubercle on this image is incorrectly identified now we need to identify it correctly here see this let me point again so that it will be easy for you to understand see this this bulge part this big part this is called greater tubercle or greater tuberosity now just look at this this small bulge here this is the lesser tubercle not this one lesser tubercle is present here okay and there is a nice ridge present between greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle now this is the head of the humerus very uh, rounded and very smooth area if somebody give you the real bone and ask you where is the head just feel it it feels very very smooth and very rounded area now you can clearly see this line here this is the anatomical neck here is the anatomical neck this area and this is the surgical neck right here this surgical neck is very commonly fractured in the clinical practice so this is the lateral view they are showing it once again and this type of uh, lateral view is called okay this is the lateral view actually this this is called near view okay let's talk about the lateral view first and then we'll go go on to the near view so lateral view we are taking x ray from the lateral side so already talked about the different structures are here so please repeat it once again and this near view means uh, we are taking the x ray from superior side okay uh, a bit of tilted type of x ray to see the supraspinatus outlet this is the supraspinatus outlet where the supraspinatus muscle is usually located uh, so this type of x ray is sometimes necessary to see exactly what type of fracture is there in the shoulder area and what type of displacement or dislocation is there in the shoulder area just a type of x-ray okay nothing more than that now, another type of view is also there in the adult shoulder when we want to take the x-ray this is called superior inferior view just taking the x-ray from different angle that's it sometimes isn't it we, we are confused if we only take view from one side so to make the concept very clear we take the x-ray from different side different angle so these are the different view so that's the concept now with this okay background information or general you know discussion about the shoulder joint let's enter into the topic of dislocation so in the beginning i talk about the general discussion about dislocation and subluxation what are the clinical feature what are the physical examination finding how we treat it then after doing that i'll enter into the shoulder joint dislocation now please focus here this is a very important topic from the exam point of view a dislocation is a complete displacement of articular surfaces from each other now look at this picture here okay these are the the articular surfaces this is the shoulder joint so the two articular surfaces are head of the humerus and glenoid cavity now they are completely separated or displaced from each other this is dislocation a dislocated bone is no longer in its normal position it has come out of the normal position there is no contact between the two bones one of the big problem of dislocation is it may cause ligament damage or nerve damage when it is taken forcefully out because of the trauma or injury the ligaments are torn or ruptured at the same time there are some nerves which are surrounding this joint now right now i'm uh, taking the example of shoulder joint so there is a axillary nerve there this axillary nerve may be severely damaged at the same time brachial plexus is also very near so that brachial plexus can also be injured dislocations may be associated with the periarticular fracture as well it depends on what type of injury or what type of trauma and this periarticular fracture makes this dislocation a very serious one so for example
the person may be presenting with fracture of this one acromion process sometime fracture of the clavicular process like that or coracoid process i should say a fracture of greater tuberosity of the humerus or lesser tubercle of the humerus like that so uh, x ray is the must to detect this small type fracture now what is subluxation and what is the difference between dislocation and subluxation you will get your answer after going through this subluxation is an incomplete or partial displacement incomplete or partial displacement where the articular surfaces are still retaining some contact between them so slight separation but still they are touching with each other this is subluxation very easy type of understanding and this is not a first time we are talking we are talking about this definition from right the beginning of the class now what is the or what are the causes of a dislocation okay let's talk about them see here the causes of dislocation the two important causes of the dislocation here are traumatic and pathological dislocation traumatic is much more common than pathological in this uh, condition the dislocations are usually caused by sudden impact to the joint sudden impact that how injury occurs for example you are traveling in a in a car or a motor bike or in the bus if you suddenly suffer from the accident and that's what sudden impact is all about so this usually occurs following a blow okay following a fall or other type of trauma whereas pathological dislocation means the joints are already having some disease or they are already having defective ligament so in other word they are already weaker on top of that if there is a slight amount of trauma or injury they can easily displace or dislocated and examples of those diseases are rheumatoid arthritis and some tumors rheumatoid arthritis is a very common you know disease where uh, a bone or joint becomes weaker now all of you please focus on your screen and see here now different types of pictures are okay collected from the internet site here now this uh, particular you know the top two the three okay first second and third they uh, are occurring in a sports person okay weight lifting is one of the important cause of shoulder dislocation so he is a weight lifter and he is suffering from shoulder dislocation this is probably the basketball player okay probably he fall very badly on the shoulder in the cricket player also the shoulder joint may pop out from the glenoid cavity very commonly and football player the shoulder joint is one of the commonest joint to be dislocated and this can you see this what is happening to the joint can you comment on this look at the rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid arthritis very good this is a case of rheumatoid arthritis you are absolutely correct so what can you see what are the findings there inflammations of the interphalangeal joints and deformity of the bone swelling of the joints interphalangeal of the joint uh, flexion degeneration and swelling good good so see that so as a medical student okay sometimes we just ask question like this can you describe the finding whatever you can see there so you know this is a habit you need to learn so it's not that difficult questions okay whatever you can see just describe that so many students are saying it correctly there are swellings in the joint see this this is swelling okay so we need we have to give the name of this joint so this is proximal interphalangeal proximal interphalangeal joint isn't it proximal very good this is proximal pip this is dip distal interphalangeal joint and both are shown here 
Another important point is deformity. They are deformed. They are bent. Our fingers should never be like that. So swelling as well as deformity are very prominently seen in these fingers. So this has to be the case of rheumatoid arthritis and this, this joint are very easy to displace. Now, let's move on. Now, let's classify this different type of dislocation. You see here, these dislocations are classified as anterior dislocation, posterior dislocation, or inferior dislocation according to the presence of the lower bone. We always talk, where is that lower part of the bone is present? If it is present anterior to the upper bone, we call it anterior dislocation. If it is present posterior to the upper bone, this is posterior. And if it is inferior, we call it inferior dislocation. In a shoulder joint, these are the different you know, types. Another classification is fresh dislocation or delayed dislocation. Sometimes patient quickly come to the hospital, okay, just after the dislocation or within the two weeks, we still call it fresh type of dislocation and delayed. If they ignore, sometimes they even don't know the dislocation has happened there, you know. In older people, uh, it can happen, especially in shoulder joint. So that is a delayed dislocation. Initial or habitual. Habitual is more than two times. Initial is the first time. So this is another type of classification. Open dislocation and closed dislocation. Now, this is exactly like open fracture or the closed fracture. Along with the dislocation, if there is fracture of that particular bone which is involved, and if it is communicating outside, we call that open dislocation. Closed dislocation, we cannot see from outside. And the last one, we have discussed it already, whether it is dislocation or whether it is subluxation, we need to be sure about it. So these are the different types of the classification. Now, we have to give the name of that dislocation. For example, if it is a shoulder dislocation, now, how we tell it is an anterior dislocation, posterior dislocation, inferior dislocation, open dislocation, or whether it is associated with fracture or not, isn't it? So how to give that name? Now pay attention, though I have already explained this to you. First of all, we have to name the joint which is affected here. And we all know that from our anatomical knowledge. How we know that is a shoulder joint? Because we identify that's a humerus or that's the scapula. So the joint between them has to be the shoulder joint. That's the first thing. Second, name the dislocation by the position of the distal fragment in relation to the proximal fragment. The distal fragment in case of shoulder joint is head of the humerus and the proximal fragment is glenoid fossa. So if head of the humerus is present anterior to the glenoid fossa, we call it anterior dislocation. If it is present posterior to the glenoid fossa, posterior dislocation. If it is present inferior to this, inferior dislocation. Let's take the example of hip joint now. In case of hip joint, the distal fragment is head of the femur and the proximal fragment is acetabulum. If head of the femur has come out anterior to the acetabulum, we call it anterior dislocation of the hip. If it goes backside, we call it posterior. So always remember that. In case of a fracture also, the same thing is considered. What type of fracture is this? If your examiner asks, you always look at the distal fragment, where that distal fragment is moving in relation to the proximal fragment. Accordingly, we give the name of the fracture. Now, third important point here, add fracture to the name if there is a periarticular fracture. Look around that joint. Look all the bones which are there and look very carefully if there are any fracture line. 
and if there are any you need to mention that particular point otherwise your diagnosis would be incomplete and you may easily miss that type of fracture patient will have prolonged pain from that and another is add open if a wound communicate with the dislocation exactly like a open or compound fracture here so these are the different nomenclature for dislocation okay so let's move on now let's talk about a clinical features of dislocation now if a joint is dislocated what are the symptoms complained by the patient the first of all patient will say what type of injury or if patient do not uh, you know explain about the injury you should ask that question in the history what type of injury you suffered from what type of trauma or blow it was okay and we can have a lot of uh, you know a concept regarding the dislocation second is pain the pain is very severe this is a joint dislocation we are talking about it will lead to rupture of the ligament or injury to the ligament which are surrounding the joint okay so the pain is very severe sometime there is peri articular fracture as well that will also add on the pain swelling is quite common it depends on the uh, you know related injury there if there is associated fracture the swelling is massive it is because of the formation of hematoma there okay and if the, in case of uh, complete dislocation uh, the swelling is present a little bit you know uh, inferior or anterior or posterior to the joint and sometimes the overall structure of the joint is change for example in case of shoulder joint there is a nice bulge of the shoulder we all uh, know that but that nice bulging of the shoulder is lost in case of dislocation we cannot you know uh, we can we have to compare with the normal side and it is very obvious another is a difficulty in moving the joint quite naturally the joint has you know disrupted okay uh, uh, one component has come out from the other so the functions of the joint is lost the person cannot move it the active movement is impossible and there is numbness and paresthesia this is because of damage to the nerve which is uh, supplying the joint or which nerve is around the joint we are talking about the different clinical features of joint dislocation now what are the signs during physical examination what findings we get in dislocation of the joint the most important one is there is abnormal joint or in other word the natural contour or natural shape of that joint is distorted in other word it is look like a visibly out of place okay an abnormal type of joint the natural or the normal contour or the shape of the shoulder is disrupted in case of shoulder joint dislocation that what we are talking right now and sometimes there may be discoloration as well that is because of the trauma there is limited joint movement definitely there are two types of joint movement which we uh, talk uh, clinically one is passive movement of the joint another is active movement of the joint active movement means patient himself or herself are moving the joint passive okay we are moving the joint during our examination so there is limited joint movement in both the condition the joint may be swollen or bruised it is intensely painful okay the person cannot bear any weight or cannot move the joint at all the function is lost there may be decreased sensation distal to the joint especially if the nerve is damaged the nerve which is uh, around the joint and in case of neurovascular you know injury especially the blood vessel there is decreased pulse or the extremity which is distal to the joint become cooler what what is the reason for this cool extremity there 
why the extremity becomes cool yes blood, su blood supply blood, blood supply is decreased exactly it is because of loss of blood supply it's a feature of ischemia of that particular part so in case of a shoulder joint uh, dislocation uh, we uh, palpate the brachial pulse or the radial pulse so the volume of the pulse would be decreased if it is damaging those particular you know blood vessels okay that's the meaning though it is very rare in case of shoulder joint dislocation you know decreased pulse the chances are quite rare but in some other type of dislocation it may be seen now the, regarding the lab examination or lab investigation the x ray is always done if you suspect dislocation of any particular joint and the x rays are usually taken in the two standard view one is a lateral view and another one is a ap view okay lateral view and ap view now see there this is the uh, elbow joint and there is a elbow joint dislocation here the lateral x ray is showing it very clearly so please focus here all of you see this so what is this bone what is this bone humerus exactly humerus you have to say lower end of the humerus that is a quite a correct description and what about this bone this one ulna exactly upper part or upper end of the ulna so lower end of the humerus and upper end of the ulna now see this carefully the lower end of the humerus is not okay uh, into this only cranon cavity or fossa it is it has come out of it so this is the dislocation you can clearly see in the ap view it is not very clear you can see this it is not very clear that's why you have to take two standard view for the complete diagnosis so that's what is written here two planes at 90 degrees to each other these are the principles of x ray in the classes of fracture also we talked about that x ray should be of good quality okay these are the standard view and we must see the entire joint okay. and sometimes it is said we have to see the two joint now let me explain why the two joints are important here sometimes there is associated fracture or dislocation in the upper or the lower joint if you do not include that joint then that fracture would be missed Now, regarding the general treatment of dislocation and subluxation let's talk about that now first is the diagnosis after the diagnosis we have to reduce the dislocation instantly or as soon as possible you cannot say oh i cannot come in the middle of the night so can we do that tomorrow not at all this is a orthopedic emergency you have to run to the hospital whatever time it is and you have to take care of that case this is the meaning of emergency it cannot be postponed so dislocation reduction can be done by two different way one is manipulation under anesthesia another one is surgical reduction after reduction you have to check the neurovascular function distal to the dislocation whether there is any damage done to the nerve or the blood vessel now how to check that check for the sensation okay if sensation is intact distal to the dislocation then we believe okay the nerve is not damaged another important point is the pulse the pulse should be as strong as on the other side which is not affected and palpate for the temperature of the uh you know extremity of that particular affected site if it is still warm if it is not you know uh, abnormally cold then we believe circulation is intact another important examination you can do is capillary refill time it should be normal take the post reduction radiograph and compare it now you have already taken the x ray after the dislocation after you have done reduction take the x ray again the joint should look normal now then only you are satisfied 
and another important treatment is immobilize the joint do not leave the joint like that why because there is extensive ligament damage as a result of dislocation if i do not immobilize the joint for certain week that ligament damage is not going to heal so strap the joint immobilize the joint for certain duration after the reduction now these are certain reduction technique okay a bit of practical information now give enough sedation to the patient before you reduce the dislocated joint because it is a very painful procedure so that sedation is doing two different things there one reduce the pain second relax the muscle as well now the combination of drugs can be given for that purpose now which are those important combination of the drug we give uh, to reduce the pain and to relax the muscle yes which which drug digipam in the digestion for the muscle relaxation digipam and to reduce the pain which 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 uh, medicine ligonokin okay digipam and opioid okay digipam and opioid analgesics if i combine like that you know uh, sorry i the opioid analgesic like morphine if i combine these two drugs let me explain you the use of these two drugs now digipam will induce sleep sedation in the patient at the same time it relax the muscle relaxation of muscle is very necessary for the proper reduction another drug morphine it also induces sedation as well as it decreases the pain and this is a good combination together okay now uh, uzer was uh, telling uh, the use of lignocaine also yes we can also go for the lignocaine for the regional block this is called regional block we can infiltrate lignocaine around the nerve so that the patient will not feel any pain during the reduction but rather than that we 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 can go for this type of medicine now second important you know reduction technique is apply traction force and counter traction force to rectify the displacement and relax the muscle this is very important so we need uh, at least two person okay for the reduction of the dislocation one person okay which is who is the you know main person who is treating the patient for example the main surgeon orthopedic surgeon he will apply the traction force and another person should apply the counter traction force in opposite direction this is very necessary and at the same time the person who is applying the traction force will manipulate the joint either flexion extension adduction abduction pronation supination external rotation internal rotation something like that and he should make sure the joint has gone back into its original position then only okay the, the surgeon would be satisfied so this is this is called manipulating the joint and this is how the reduction is completed okay now see here now with this let's start the discussion of shoulder dislocation this is just a general uh, you know dislocation we are talking about it it is applicable to all type of dislocation but let's focus entirely on the shoulder joint dislocation now there are three types of uh, classification in shoulder joint dislocation anterior which is the forward dislocation posterior or backward dislocation an inferior or downward dislocation and let me remind you again how this term has been given this term has been given because of the position of head of the humerus in relation to the glenoid cavity if humeral head is anterior or in in front of the glenoid cavity we call that anterior dislocation if it is on the back side of the glenoid cavity posterior 
and it will is inferior to the glenoid cavity we call it inferior dislocation very easy type of nomenclature now this uh, particular x ray you have already seen now why i am uh, you know repeating this x ray again here okay because we are specifically moving into the shoulder joint dislocation now so let me highlight the important point once again here see this this is the area we are focusing right now only here this is the head of the humerus and this is the glenoid fossa this joint is normal it is not displaced it is not dislocated or subluxated if this head of the humerus comes anterior to this glenoid uh, fossa somewhere here okay we call this anterior dislocation if it is going backward we call it posterior if it is coming immediately inferior side and if it comes inferior remember this uh, humerus will go upward now because it is a inverted type of arrangement when head comes distally the distal part will move upwards so this is a very funny type of appearance in the patient sometimes they come to the hospital with this type of dis dislocation and they raise their arm or they raise their upper limb above the head this is a very typical description of inferior dislocation of the shoulder let's move on now this is a, a, a very good schematic diagram which is showing the different types of dislocation of the shoulder every student can understand it so easily this is a normal anatomy of the shoulder joint they are in nicely in contact with each other this is anterior dislocation here is the posterior dislocation okay very easy to understand now see this the another picture is also showing the same thing this is posterior dislocation there is a rupture look at the rupture here rupture of the muscle as well as the ligaments and the uh, head of the humerus is going backward and this is called inferior dislocation look at the arrangement here look at the arrangement of the upper limb or the humerus the head of the humerus is here and it is going downwards so what about the distal part of the humerus now it is going upward so the patient comes to the hospital with raised arm above the head and this type of you know observation instantly gives you the diagnosis this is inferior dislocation of the shoulder joint now look at this look at this patient here okay this is the typical picture of inferior dislocation of the shoulder joint this is the typical picture and this is the schematic diagram the humeral head has gone down than the glenoid cavity so once again anterior dislocation posterior dislocation and inferior dislocation among them anterior is the most common type followed by posterior and inferior is very very rare but some of the patient may present to the hospital with this type as well now what is the mechanism of injury here what type of injury presents or causes these types of dislocation see here 95% of the shoulder dislocations are traumatic and it is very age dependent in case of older people even slight amount of trauma can dislocate isn't it because uh, probably a you know reason of pathology there the, the, the ligaments are a little bit lax there there may be you know other pathology as well in the younger age group athletic injuries are common sports injury we say different type of sports like the person was playing cricket and he dived on the cricket field to take the catch okay and because of you know some type of slippage on the ground or because of the slippage of the foot on the ground he badly landed on the shoulder 
and this is one of the commonest cause of shoulder dislocation in a football player similar type of injury can happen okay a basketball player similar type of injury can happen and very commonly in a weight lifter also this type of shoulder dislocations are quite common inferior dislocation is the result of hyper abduction force that levers the proximal humerus against the acromion and out of the glenoid inferiorly now this is a very interesting type of mechanism so please pay attention here everyone know what is abduction of the shoulder joint i already told you abduction is raising the arm on the side way okay on the side of the body if you raise the upper arm now just just do that and when you take the arm you know on the side of the head okay see that the head of the humerus comes a little bit inferiorly now if there is some injury which occurs when the person was doing this type of activity okay there is a sudden uh, you know fearful blow or a lot of vigorous trauma from the side which will cause hyper abduction injury to the shoulder joint then that head of the humerus may pop out of the glenoid cavity resulting in inferior dislocation and the person would present to the hospital like that now that is the deformity let's talk about each of these uh, types in short now over 95% of the shoulder dislocation are anterior we already know that fact and most of the anterior dislocations are subcoracoid subcoracoid means the head of the humerus is lying below the coracoid process of the scapula so this is important point to note see this because in the x ray we need to find this out we need to find where is the coracoid process and if the head is lying immediately below than that we call it subcoracoid displacement it is very common in anterior shoulder dislocation rarely the head may just be present below the glenoid cavity which is subglenoid below the clavicle subclavicular and very rarely intrathoracic may also occur intrathoracic means it is going way down okay uh, uh, this is very rare now what about posterior shoulder dislocation now the posterior shoulder dislocations are occasionally due to electrocution or seizure now what is electrocution what is this anyone electric shock exactly okay this is electrical shock injury and so many uh, of the people they come to the hospital because of electric shock injury is it this is a lethal type of injury remember this electric shock can easily leads to extensive damage to the muscles in that uh, patient's body as well as it can uh, cause cardiac arrhythmia can lead to death of the patient at the same time this type of dislocations can also be cause another is seizure or epilepsy this epileptic attack or seizure attack in the patient of epilepsy may also lead to vigorous contraction of the muscle and posterior dislocation of the shoulder can occur the posterior dislocation often go unnoticed especially in very old type of patient there was one study done okay and in a series of 40 patient that study was done and that shows there is a average interval of one year okay between the injury and diagnosis of posterior dislocation in a uh, elderly patient so sometimes it often go unnoticed means that there, there may not be much sign and symptom in the posterior dislocation uh, of the shoulder now this inferior dislocation many of the point we have already talked about take it as a bit of revision for you this is the least likely type and this is caused by hyper abduction injury of the shoulder joint is an important point you should never forget it occurs in just 1% and 
there is a uh, another term for this okay and that term is known as luxatio erecta luxatio erecta that means the arm appears to be permanently held upward or behind the head in some of the mcq question they simply uh, give this term and ask you luxatio erecta in this uh, you know type of dislocation of the shoulder joint where is the head or something like that you know so you need to be prepared what is the meaning of this you need to know luxatio erecta is a synonymous term for inferior dislocation of the shoulder joint the inferior dislocations have a high complication rate as many vascular neurological tendon and ligament injuries are likely to occur from this kind of dislocation so uh, there is a high chance of axillary nerve damage okay and if axillary nerve is damaged what will happen to the patient yes <coughs> no abduction will be deltoid muscle will be affected good deltoid muscle will be affected that is one answer any other any other what will happen rotation of the shoulder will not occur because of rotative cuff muscle rotation of the shoulder will not occur okay yes some movement of the shoulder will not occur especially the abduction good one more okay which i have not told you before uh, what is the sensory function of axillary nerve who can answer this to me is there any sensory function of axillary nerve or not anyone which part is supplied by axillary nerve regarding the sensation now listen here okay. apart from the deltoid muscle let me write it here deltoid teres minor okay teres minor is also supplied by axillary nerve there is a small patch of the skin small patch of skin just okay superficial just superficial to the insertion of deltoid means around the lesser tubercle that area that small patch of the skin is also supplied by axillary nerve so we check that particular area or uh, to find out the sensory function of axillary nerve whether it is damaged or not okay uh, if you want to have a bit of a detailed knowledge regarding this i want you to follow some anatomy book please study about the origin of axillary nerve how it comes out of the brachial plexus and what are the function let's move on now before we move further uh let's look at this three three x ray okay. all of the student please focus on this x ray these are very very important one now see here, you need to really understand okay though the leveling has been done already but you need to understand where is the head of the humerus in comparison to glenoid cavity or fossa so this is anterior dislocation here is the posterior dislocation and this is the inferior one this is inferior one it may look a bit a bit like anterior actually okay but it is uh, written as inferior here this is another x ray which is showing the anterior dislocation this is anterior look at the head of the humerus here here is the head the big head okay anterior dislocation this is the coracoid process so the head is a uh, present below the coracoid this is a coracoid process so below the coracoid sub coracoid type of dislocation another one okay there is one uh, 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 additional finding here so that additional finding is a bit of depression see here a bit of depression at the head and this type of cortical depression in the humeral head is called hill sacks deformity 
Hill Sachs deformity, very important MCQ question in the orthopedic exam. This Hill Sachs deformity is developed because of sudden hitting of the humeral head on the margin of the glenoid cavity. It results in Hill Sachs deformity. So this is a part of the anterior dislocation of the shoulder. Now, all of you, please focus on this X-ray. This is a better one than before. This is the inferior dislocation of the shoulder. Now look at the position, very typical. Okay, the distal part of the humerus is upward. This is the head of the humerus, which is going downward. Okay, this A is for acromion process. C is for coracoid process. Okay, so this is the humeral head inferior dislocation of the shoulder. Now, these are, okay, the different types of sports. Both, both pictures are showing the weight lifting actually here, but this is a very common type of sports where shoulder dislocation occurs commonly. Look at this, this particular shoulder. It looks visibly out of the order, okay? It doesn't look normal at all. And the person is clutching that particular area, okay, and crying with pain. This exactly happens in case of shoulder dislocation. It's a very painful type of experience. Now, after all this discussion, let's talk about how to diagnose shoulder joint dislocation. Now you have to combine everything together. What is the history of injury? What type of injury was there? Number one. Number two, what are the symptoms given by the patient during your history taking? Number three, what physical examination finding okay, you have collected? And number four, what investigation you have done and what is the finding of that? If we combine everything together, the diagnosis is very easy to reach. Okay, so let's talk about that. So there is a history of injury especially the sports injury or severe type of trauma. There may be significant pain in the patient. And sometimes the pain is felt past the shoulder and along the arm. It depends on the nerve injury or nerve compression. Another important symptom is inability to move the arm from its current position. Okay, this is impossible. And another is numbness of the arm. This numbness is again, uh, depends on the nerve injury or nerve damage. Now, please focus on your screen. Now see there, what can you see? Can you describe this particular picture? Yes, this portion, what can you see here? In this area, see this? Anybody? Anybody? Yes, sir. yes, please. Yeah, yeah. They're tired, they're tired. It's a little bit downward. Okay. Yes, swell. Very good. Yes, Rana Atisham, what is your explanation there? Sir, that tired is downward. Good. You can simply say, you are right, actually. You can simply say, if I compare with this side, which is normal, look at the nice bulge of the deltoid there. This is a deltoid muscle. This is a good bulge on the side of the shoulder joint. Where is this now? I cannot see it. Okay, where is this nice bulge? It is gone because the head of the humerus is displaced from its normal position. So this is a very typical finding of shoulder joint dislocation. And one more thing, look at the length of the arm here. Okay, the elbow is right here. See this, this arm is hang downwards. So it looks a little bit longer, okay? Because the person is catching this particular limb or forearm with the another one. It cannot be even hanged. It causes a lot of pain if the person is trying to do that, okay? So the person will catch that particular, you know, arm or forearm with the another hand.
So for the diagnosis, we need to examine this patient and these are the typical sign. Visibly displaced shoulder, that's the picture we were seeing right now. Some dislocation result in the shoulder appearing unusually square or that natural bulge caused by or presented or formed by the deltoid muscle is lost. One very important sign which is mentioned in different textbook is called Dugas sign. Okay, Dugas sign. This Dugas sign is present in this case. Now, what is this Dugas sign? Please pay attention. This is a very simple clinical test for dislocated shoulder. When the hand of the affected side is placed on the opposite shoulder, the elbow cannot be made to touch the chest. Let me underline the important points here. This is a simple clinical test for the dislocated shoulder. And in this uh, you know, type of uh, test, we put the hand of the affected side on the opposite shoulder. And we just observe whether the elbow of that affected hand or side touch the chest or not. In case of dislocation of the shoulder, this is impossible. The person cannot, cannot put, okay, cannot put this hand on the opposite shoulder on his own. This is impossible. But we can do that. We can catch that, uh, you know, dislocated hand and put on the opposite shoulder of the patient. This is the passive movement, isn't it? We can do. Patient will complain a lot of pain. But if we, if we want to do, we can do that. And after doing that, just observe whether the elbow is touching the chest or not. Elbow will not touch chest in this condition. This is called positive Dugas sign. And this is one of the important tests we can do to confirm shoulder joint dislocation. The investigation we like to do in this case is definitely X-ray, the plain X-ray in different view. The two important views are AP view and the lateral view, but different types of view can be taken. It depends on which type of uh, dislocation you are suspecting. Something known as near view is there, okay? Uh, so all, all other types are there. You see it. So look at this picture now. From this radiograph, we can easily find the dislocation of the shoulder joint here. This is an anterior type of dislocation, okay? And uh, on the other one, there is a, see this, fracture of the greater tubercle as well. Look at this area. Let me use the pointer here. See this, this particular area, you can see the small chip of the bone which is coming out. So this is associated fracture of the greater tubercle along with dislocation of the shoulder joint. So this is called periarticular fracture. Okay, we have to detect it in time. So I have repeated uh, this uh, X-ray once again. We have already seen this before. So these are the diagnostic X-rays for the different types of shoulder dislocation, anterior, posterior, and inferior type of dislocation. Regarding this inferior, this is not that, you know, good type of, you know, a typical sign, I should say. Another one which I showed you before was much better than this. Now, we have come towards the end of the shoulder uh, dislocation topic. What is the treatment you like to do? Okay, and the remaining part, I'll continue in the next class. What is the treatment? Now let's for, not, not forget the general uh, uh, principles of management of dislocation, which we have recently discussed. This is orthopedic emergency. So we have to be hurry, okay? We have to uh, relocate the joint in time. This is called reduction. And the most commonly done is a manual reduction. Manual reduction under sedation. Sedation would be given definitely, like dizepam or opioid analgesics uh, should be given. And then uh, we have to reduce. There are variety of techniques available and these are called Hippocrates technique. 
Stimson technique and Cocker maneuver. Okay, we'll talk about that in the next class. We have to hang the affected limb with elbow in 90 degree and strap it for a few weeks. Okay, an early functional exercise has to be done. Now, have a look at this picture. See this? These are the different types of okay, support we give to the dislocated shoulder after we relocate it, after we reduce it, you know. This is the way we support the shoulder. Okay. Different types of support can be given. Now, what do you mean by this Hippocratic technique to reduce the dislocation of shoulder joint? In this, the patient is positioned supine, just like this. Okay, see here, patient is positioned supine. Then the heel of the foot of the orthopedic surgeon now see this this is the lower limb of that surgeon and this is the heel okay right here the heel of the foot is placed against the humeral head in the axilla which is dislocated there then longitudinal traction is applied to the arm the surgeon continuously pull the arm okay in this direction towards him at the same time, the surgeon has to internally rotate and adduct the arm. Internal rotation and adduction of the arm. And after this type of maneuver, the head of the shoulder will pop into the uh, glenoid cavity. So this is known as Hippocratic technique. This is just one of the method. Another is called Stimson technique. Now see this. If you uh, look at this picture, it is quite uh, well understood. The patient is positioned prone now, okay, prone position on the bed or on the examination table. The arm is allowed to hang down with 10 kg of weight. So see this, the 10 kg of weight is applied on the hanging okay, arm at the wrist area. Because of the effect of this gravity and this weight, okay, uh, there is reduction of the dislocated joint and for this technique some form of muscular relaxation is usually required now what type of relaxation we, we provide to the patient what is that drug which gives muscle relaxation which drug okay now the important answer is digipalm very good digipalm a type of benzodiazepine, it has two important functions there. One is muscle relaxation and another is sedation. Another is sedation. So this may be a bit of painful procedure. So sedation is also wanted here. A diclofenac will decrease the pain only. Okay, it doesn't uh, provide sedation. Now, Cocker maneuver is the third one. This is called Cocker maneuver. The patient is positioned supine again on the bed. Traction is continuously provided by holding the elbow at 90 degree. So the traction is given in this direction towards the inferior side. At the same time, externally rotate the humerus. Just exactly like this shown in the picture. The surgeon will give adduction and internally rotate the shoulder as well. And after all this procedure, uh, the shoulder joint will relocate into the glenoid cavity. So this is known as Cocker maneuver, very commonly done in the clinical practice. So these are the different techniques, you know, by which reduction of dislocated shoulder joint is done. If all of these, you know, process fails, and in some of the indications which we are going to talk, surgical treatment is necessary. Now, surgical treatment means it's an open reduction, open reduction. And these are the important indications like combined greater humeral tubercle fracture okay along with dislocation if the greater tubercle of the humerus is fractured now this is a complicated type of fracture dislocation now combined surgical humeral neck fracture combined scapular fracture combined means along with dislocation you know all these things are happening some delayed type of dislocation 
and habitual dislocation more than one time. So all these are uh, treated by open reduction. This is a type of surgical treatment. Now, what are the complications of shoulder dislocation? What can happen to the patient as a complication? Early complication and late, we have divided into two parts. So let's discuss one after other. See this? The early complications would be axillary nerve injury and rotator cuff or capsular tear. If that a shoulder joint is forcefully driven outside the glenoid cavity, the rotator and capsular tear would occur. The important one is axillary nerve injury. Now, every student know by now from where axillary nerve originates, from where it comes. Yes. What is the origin of axillary nerve? Brachial plexus. Brachial plexus. Which cord of brachial plexus? It has got three cords. Which cord? Posterior cord. Posterior cord. Very good, very good, excellent. It is from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. Good, okay. And regarding the root value, it has got C5 and C6. C5 and C6 are the root value of axillary nerve. Okay, these are the root value of axillary nerve. And then the important muscle, which are supplied by axillary nerve, so many times we are repeated but it is such an important point. Let me write that for you so that you'll never forget. Is deltoid, deltoid, and teres minor. Okay? And then it has a small sensory function as well. It takes the sensation from the shoulder joint. This is one uh, sensory function. And another important one, it innervates the skin. It innervates the skin okay which is just inferior okay just inferior to the deltoid muscle okay so let me shift this so that you can clearly see it so skin just inferior to the uh, deltoid muscle or inferior skin just inferior to the deltoid muscle this skin is also known as, or that area actually is also known as regimental badge area. Now, why that name is given? Okay, there is a meaning. Remember the army personnel. Okay, remember those sergeants. Now they have, uh, you know, their badge exactly, you know, formed or present in that area. So this area is also innervated by axillary nerve and this is the sensory function okay not the motor one now easily if this question is asked every student can handle it what will happen if axillary nerve is damaged because of shoulder joint dislocation deltoid muscle is paralyzed teres minor muscle is paralyzed and the person will lose the sensation from regimental badge area after deltoid is paralyzed there is no abduction of the arm and the rounded bulge which is formed by deltoid on the shoulder area is lost that shoulder joint or shoulder appearance will become flat so these are the important points let's move on what are the late uh, type of okay or late type of complications see here now the late complications shoulder stiffness is one of the least complications, especially if the person doesn't go for physiotherapy. After we relocate the joint into its original site, okay, the person should take few weeks of rest and after that, active range of motion should be started. Otherwise, there would be stiffness of the shoulder joint. Sometimes the person will suffer from recurrent dislocation and these are the usual causes for that. Now, just have a look there. What are the causes of recurrent dislocation? See there. Marfan syndrome, inadequate treatment of the first episode of dislocation, and epileptic patient. Now, we all know something about Marfan syndrome. This is autosomal dominant disorder, 
which may run in the family it is actually classified under a type of connective tissue disorder where most of the connective tissue are lax okay they are overly elastic some of the important clinical feature are cardiovascular some problem occur in the eye okay and in the joint now what happens in cardiovascular system in case of marfan syndrome aortic regurgitation sir aortic regurgitation mitral valve prolapse good excellent mitral excellent okay all the answers are coming aortic regurgitation and mitral valve prolapse aortic regurgitation and mitral valve prolapse now you can also add one more thing there dissection of the aorta dissection of the aorta this is known as dissecting aneurysm of the aorta this all this is also seen in a marfan syndrome apart from that okay in the eye there is dislocation of the lens the lens of the eye is dislocated in marfan syndrome and then in the joint they are on usually lax okay so that's why they can be dislocated easily these people are very tall okay they are excessively tall person sex can be anything okay this is autosomal dominant disorder remember it may happen in male or female both sex and then the arm span is more than the total height these are the feature of marfan syndrome now epileptic patient especially generalized tonic clonic type of seizure those type of you know situation can also dislocate the joint let's move on now Now, what is the prognosis of shoulder dislocation? Okay, what is the chance of recurrence rate in the future? If shoulder dislocation occurs at the age of less than twenty year, see, look at the chance of dislocation is very high, sixty five to ninety five percent. Okay, at the age of twenty to forty year, sixty to seventy percent, and if it is occur relatively. uh after 40 year then the uh, chance of dislocation is 2 to 4 percent only it may be associated with different etiology now something about recurrent dislocation and the treatment now recurrent dislocation is uh, you know repeated type of dislocation or habitual type of dislocation and we already know the different causes for that like marfan syndrome okay if the treatment was not done properly in the first time or a uh, 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 repeated you know seizure attack or epileptic attack in a patient especially the generalized tonic clonic type of seizure so how we handle that case what is the management the treatment is usually surgical and these are the different type of surgery just try to remember the name okay in detail nobody would, is going to ask you and the different names of surgery are putty plat operation bankers operation and arthroscopic bankers repair now the meaning is written here putty plat operation means it's a double breasting of subscapularis tendon okay double breasting of subscapularis tendon means we are strengthening the support of rotator cuff muscle there subscapularis is one of the rotator cuff muscle and we we hope that the shoulder joint will be stable after doing this banker suppression is see this the glenoid labrum and the capsule of the shoulder joints are reattached to the front of glenoid rim now glenoid rim is the circumference of the glenoid cavity and what is glenoid labrum by the way what do you mean by that What is glenoid fibrocartilaginous rim, sir? Around the shoulder. Fibrocartilaginous ring, sir. Rim around the glenoid ring. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Every students are, uh, you know, answering correctly. This is a fibrocartilaginous rim, which is attached to the glenoid rim. Fibrocartilaginous rim. Okay, glenoid labrum. It acts as a support for the shoulder joint stability. Now. in case of 
recurrent or habitual dislocation probably there is damage of those glenoid labrum and the capsule so in banker separation they are reattaching them again that's the meaning and uh, the banker's uh, operation can be done with the help of arthroscope this is a special instrument which can be used for the surgery of the joint so we call this arthroscopic banker's repair so these are the different uh, treatment option in recurrent dislocation